It's, so it's eight o'clock and we're at the intersection. It's so good to see all of you here with me this morning. We even have Sharon here from Canada who's with us. Yay, Sharon. It's so nice. It makes me feel stronger when I see Sharon with us, like somebody from Canada. By the way, Sharon, we have Mayor David West from Richmond Hills coming to San Antonio next week, and he's going to be on the Compassionate Americas panel in San Antonio at the All America Summit. So I'm very excited about that Canadian mayor. We also have a mayor on the panel from uh, Brazil. And so it's, it's very exciting to kind of hear that conversation uh, around mayors from North Central, um, we got Mexico coming and talking about uh, how sister cities can become compassionate cities and how that might boost all of what's happening in the world. Okay, wanna open this up to uh, brief announcements. If anybody has any, just jump on in. And I see Mark Wittick and I owe him an answer. I just remembered, sorry, man. Uh, any announcements this morning? I have an announcement. Go Joy. Okay, so um, it is for June night, the Race Amity Day. Um, it's just going to be a celebration of racial amity and building relationships across racial lines. It is based on um, the National Race Amity Day, and it used to exist in San Antonio um, nationwide. It's held second Sunday in June. Uh, this year, it's just going to be an open house at the Baha'i Center on Magnolia Avenue, and it's going to be from one to four, and there are going to be presentations up about different racial across racial divide relationships that have happened over the centuries throughout America, as well as recent ones. And there'll be a video presentation that's ongoing and food and snacks and crafts and arts and stuff. So people please drop by. I'll put the flyer in the chat as well as the National Race Amity Organization's website. Thanks, Joy. I've been to those before. They're, they're, they're a good thing to go to. Um, but I love the open house idea too. So we get to know each other a little bit better. Other announcements of things coming up? I have one. I go Mark. On June 19th, otherwise known as Juneteenth, uh, Mario Salas will be doing a book review, Time of Hope, Time of Despair, uh, Black Texans during the Reconstruction. And it's going to be at UIW. And I'll put something in the in the chat if you want to go just just sign up that's great um also they really do need more volunteers for the all america summit next week um, that's being held at the convention center and i'll put that link in chat as well please consider um doing that and being a part of the welcome and probably other things, but the welcome to mayors and ambassadors and representatives from across all the Americas. So Sue has her hand up. Hi there. I'm out walking my dog, so I won't go on camera. But um, so the Lutherans and the AME Church are together hosting again an Emmanuel 9 commemoration service at 3.30 on Sunday, June 16th at Emmanuel's AME Church in San Antonio to commemorate the murdering of the Emanuel Nine Martyrs. So if anyone would like to join us, we'd love to have you. Thank you, Sue. Can you put some information in the chat? Oh, you're walking. Well, yeah, I'll do we'll, it. We'll I'll do, do what it we can. Okay, good. great. Great. Uh, any other announcements? So we can have time for more people to get into the Zoom here. And I just put in uh, the chat the uh, sign up for the Pathways to Hope Conference will be begin June 1 at pathwaystohope.net, August 23rd and 24th. All right. Keep that on your calendar. Um, and this is, a, I'm sorry. And this is Peter. Peter. I, I've got one. Uh, so the Office of Sustainability is kicking off its Climate Ready Neighborhoods, supporting community-based organizations and building climate readiness and community resiliency in neighborhoods tonight. It's a workshop at the SA Hope Center on General McMullen. I'll put it in the chat. It's from 6 to 7.30, part of that Resiliency Hub um, investment from the Office of Sustainability. 
Thank you, Peter. I mean, just think of the things just in the announcements, the different things that we've talked about and that we are about in the world and at the intersection, right? Between community and faith and, and civic engagement. And um, I'm just grateful for all of you and all that you're doing and what's going on out there. So we're gonna go into our briefing this morning uh, with Pastor Julie Rowe, chaplain. She serves in a, a hospital here in town and uh, Julie probably remembers better than I do how many decades we've known each other. But um, she's a Lutheran minister, and you did read a little bit about her yesterday and the notification for this morning. But Julie's book just came out this past week, and um, she's going to be, you know, just talking about um, how this came to be, what she hopes it will help do in the world. And, um, and of course, any questions and thoughts that all of you might have as well in our conversational portion. So Julie, thanks for being with us this morning. And um, I'm gonna turn it all over to you. Hi everybody. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh-oh, Anne. Yes, sir. Ma'am, is it there? You're just fine, it's on screen. Okay, okay, cool. So. Here is my book that just recently came out. And obviously it's, it's, so it's Why Peace and Prayers Are Not Enough. And it's a primer on justice and peace in Palestine and Israel. So I'll be talking a little bit about why and how this book came about. Uh, but the first page of my book, sort of one of the first pages, <laughs> is who am I and why should you care what I think? Uh, I think that's a really good question. So. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm currently a chaplain at university hospital, but, uh, a good part of my life has been spent, uh, working with, uh, the Middle East, Palestine and Israel in particular, uh, from a first trip in 91 to another trip in 2002. Uh, I was an interfaith, uh, ecumenical accompanier in Ramallah for three months. And then I worked as, uh, uh, the communication person and assistant to the Palestinian Lutheran bishop over there. So we do have a Palestinian Lutheran church. It's small, but it's mighty. It has a strong voice for justice and for reality of what's of what's coming. Uh, I mean, of what's there. So that's what I was doing. Um, I was living and working with mostly Palestinians, but also with Israelis from the peace camp. Um, and other Israelis, um, Muslims, Jewish people. Um, so it was a life-changing experience. And um, so why did I write this? I wrote it because all of these people that I, especially the Palestinians would say to me, please go home and tell the people that we are not terrorists. And there may be terrorist acts, but we are normal people. We just wanna live a life of peace and to be able to have our children go to school and have a future. Um, the other reason I wrote this is because of October 7th. I had already written part of it as my promise to the people. And then October 7th happened. And it was heartrending as it is was for all of you. Uh, the October 7th day, I couldn't it just reminded me of Rwanda and the the media, uh, the videos that were put up on the videos video on the internet celebrating the carnage. Uh, it was just, it's horrible. Then I also knew what was going to happen in Gaza, and I said, "There's, it it has been. There's about twenty six Palestinians that will be killed for every Israeli," and I remember thinking. Surely they won't get to 30,000 or even 20,000 Palestinians. And here we are today. Um, I want to start with a poem that was circulating on, um, on the uh, internet at, at that time. And it's Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? 
or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy moan or does it explode? I think Anne was with me maybe when we were in Gaza in 2002, walking through the destruction of the bombs that happened at that day, at, at that time. And we met a woman from Gaza and she was walking dazed and her face was just flat. And I remember she was saying, we are dead people. We just haven't gotten the certificates yet. And that was in 2002. And that has lasted with me. Um, I've been in Gaza twice. Gaza, which has had, I don't know how many you count wars, uh, five wars since 2000 or heavy bombings. And you think of the kids. I kept thinking of the kids, the eyes, the, the children who don't even know yet uh, in the West Bank don't know what's happening. But Gaza, all these kids know 20 year olds, 24 year olds is being locked up in Gaza where they can't leave and being bombed. That's all they know. And we live in a trauma informed society and we know what happens with trauma and how the brain changes. And I just, I don't know how that would be. Um, that's not justifying anything. It just, I think if we don't look at why things happen, we are doomed to repeat them as you have seen, as we have done. So just a few stories. Um, this book is a scrapbook of photos, pictures, information, stories, and the larger Palestinian story. That's been dismissed as our, my friends would say, because they're called terrorists or human animals lately, or, and they're just dismissed. Their voices are, are unheard. And so that, that's to lift this up um, and to tell the larger Palestinian narrative, which includes their narrative of the history, because it's different. And a lot of people I found after October 7th don't know that. Um, here was a, here's a story um, early on when I lived there. The soldier with this lung over his back, sat in the shade with his dusty boot on the Palestinian man's ID card. The Palestinian man stood in the baking hot summer sun against a concrete wall. The soldiers laughed among themselves, sometimes teasing the Palestinian, pretending to stand up, but then sitting back down and laughing. Other Palestinians passed him by, making eye contact with the man and feeling his pain. What would possess someone to do that, I wondered? The man wasn't doing anything when he presented his ID, ID card to the guard. If he was dangerous, surely they would have put him in handcuffs and carted him away. 45 minutes passed, the Palestinian now dripping sweat and red faced, shifting his weight from one foot to the other. Finally, this soldier stood up, gave him his ID and let him pass. Nothing had changed except the soldier was bored of this game. What was this? Why would someone act that way? I learned quickly, it was called the occupation and it was death by a thousand cuts. That's everyday life. Um, and the occupation affects everything they do. They are controlled, they can't leave with our, they can't uh, necessarily travel. Um, they, there's a lot of stories, but let me let me just show you one of them. So the occupation is the overriding problem um, that causes the violence and the land confiscation that goes with it because of the settlement growth. Um, because of the settlement growth, they are being also um, removed from the land. Um, so look at my page number 67, what am I on, 21. Just a couple pictures of the thing that was the most, one of the most troubling things to me because I was on an alert system. When Palestinian houses were going to be demolished, we, um, we got a text and we would, hold on, I can't do two things at once. 
Okay, here. This was, so they demolish homes for a number of reasons. One is because they don't have the proper uh, Israeli building permit, but they don't give very many of them. So here is, um, I won't read the story, but um, they, they also destroy houses if there's, a, for the families of anybody who's suspected of terrorist. And that's what this one in the lower left-hand corner is. And I was with somebody and I, it was early on, like I said, and I, I wasn't sure what the green flag was, if you could see it. And it's there. And he said, I said, what is that? He said, it's the Hamas flag. This is the best recruiting spot. And that's so true. I saw it again and again. Um, that's not many. Let me, what I did also, I'm just going to skip to hope, as Anne was talking about earlier. I had put it at the back. And then I thought, no, we need hope. We need hope. So where is the hope? I have a chapter. Um, this is a great quote, but I won't read it now, but it's about to be hopeful in bad times. It's not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. Um, it's, it's an inspiring quote, but what gave me hope was the people and what, how resilient they are and continue to act in ways that will build community. Um, the majority of the people. Um, so I worked with the Lutheran church. I said, they have schools, four schools. They teach kids, uh, they're mostly Muslim and they teach both Christian story and Muslim story together. So they learn together to mutually understand one another. Um, and that's the, that's the school. That was my favorite part um, was covering, covering that. Um, and then we have uh, another Lutheran pastor who was the Lutheran pastor in Bethlehem. And he has done all kinds of incredible ministries, arts, culture, uh, international conferences. He's a prolific writer. Um, his latest thing that he's doing is he created, he founded the Dar al Kalama University, which teaches arts, communication, culinary arts, media, tourism. And it's, uh, they've had several award-winning uh, videographers from there. And he does things like teach people how to cook. And then he has a restaurant that they can work in. That are, and the restaurant that I was at was always crowded. Um, so he was wonderful. And then this is the, um, this is the uh, 501c3 in the US that supports what they do. Um, I have references to these places in the back of the book. Um, and then this is maybe the most hopeful, uh, the parent circle. And this is a circle of people that have lost loved ones, usually children in their lives, but they have come together and formed a group where they support one another and they are united in their purpose, which is that nobody else should have to suffer this kind of grief. And they talk about the, the violence of the occupation and how that fuels so much and uh, hopelessness as Anne was talking about. So they go out and speak. And these are the two one, two guys, my favorite, Brahmi and Bassam. And I would have them come out and talk to the groups that I was leading when I was over there. And um, they're amazing. They've grown together. Um, it's, it's amazing. And there's also a, um, a, a, um, a U.S. arm of that. Um, there's a book, and I have it in here, that was about these two. It's, it looks like a novel, but it's it's a nonfiction. Uh, anyway, yeah, I was reading it one day, and I said, oh, I know these people. <laughs> um, anyway, let me, to show you the table of contents and, and what I, um, how the book is organized. As I said, it's a scrapbook. Um, and it's part of it is a chronology of, of how I learned and came to awareness of what was happening. Um, and those are some trips, the seminary trip, um, uh, the peace delegation, the ecumenical accompaniment, the Lutheran church, and then how it was to come home, which was 
uh, a trip in itself. Uh, and then a little bit about um, Christian Zionism and, and the Palestinian Christians that are there. And their story is um, my bishop that I worked with said, that is the worst thing about this whole thing is that we have people using our, our scripture. Abraham gave the land to the Jewish people using that scripture to say, you need to leave and make room for the Jewish people. And, you know, that's, yeah. So there's writers, Mitri, Bishop Yunnan, um, that talk about who Palestinian Christians are, what it's like, and, um, and how you can connect. And at the back of the book, I have, um, I have a, a list of places to learn more about it, videos, uh, some websites, and then organizations uh, or things you can do. And it's, I'm going over time here, but let me just show you at the back. Uh, uh, what can you do? Learn more. These are organizations, videos, books, and then news sources. And then these are the actions, a company. And you can meet if you don't, I mean, it's best to go over there and in a trip that is, um, gets you to the West Bank and to talk to Palestinians because many of the trips don't do that. Um, but if you can't, there's organizations like the Opportunity Palestine supports the ELCJHL schools, Bright Stars. Anyway, I have them listed here. Uh, raise awareness. Um, my hope with this book is that people who are going there will, will do it as an in introduction and a discussion. There's, there's reflection questions. So as a discussion, and then when they come back to use it to tell people, this is a collection of things, maps, photos, um, information that I would use to tell people about what was happening. So now I put it in one book. Um, advocacy, these are um, the groups that do advocacy and then uh, many churches uh, have, we have a, something was called Peace Not Walls and is now called Sumud which is folk, it's resilience and strength. And it is focusing on um, the issue of justice. Peace can be in this situation for, for one party and not for the other. Um, it can focus on normalizing the structures of occupation and oppression uh, because it, it avoids the issue, this, the larger issues of this won't stop until all voices are heard. Um, everyone has liberty and justice and freedom. Um, and that, and that's why I did this mostly. I, I want people to think about justice and, and why to think about justice and to learn more maybe help with these organizations and learn to accompany people uh, online or through these organizations. Um, do I have time for one poem? Is that okay, Ann? This was, I wrote one at the beginning, welcome to the holy in my early trips. And then this was in my later. Where was the holy? Did I touch it? Was it here? Was it chased out by the bombing, by the bullets, by the fear? If we chased out all these people, would the holiness come back? What's the sound of one God loving if there's no one loving back? I came to see and touch and smell these holy shrines and places, but most holy to me is the one who came for simple human faces. The holy is not just something far beyond or high above. God's holiness is in the world where people find the courage to love. To accompany, to walk beside, is to tread on sacred ground. A holy quest, one truly blessed, the most holy land I've found. Thank you, Julie. Um, want to open this up to some conversation, but I, I have a question while people are um, thinking of their thoughts and questions as well. So 
Um, I'm very aware, and I know you are, and everybody on the screen, that this conversation is not an easy one, even not even remotely easy. Um, and but I'm also very aware of um, my Jewish friends who are on the screen this morning who are adamant peacemakers. And um, how I know for me, the very best moments when I have traveled over there have always been at the intersection. Yeah. You know, of Israeli and Palestinian people who are working together. Those, that's where I found all my hope. That's where I found the depth. Uh, that's where I found the meaning. Um, I, I guess my question to you is, how, how could we take a book like this and um, and do our best with it? You know, like how can how can it help and not potentially incite one direction or another? How could it best help? Yeah, that was a big struggle. Um, and I tried to tell what I saw. And so I have experiences. Um, I have reflection questions. I have the some of the Israeli narrative as well. It's um, so my my hope is, as I was said before, by listening to all voices uh, and to put it in that context, because I as I said before, if we don't look at why these things happen, we will be. Um, we will be ready to, we'll just keep repeating the same old things. So my hope is that it raises awareness, but I am also aware of that. And that's why I want to experiment with it. And it's a draft. I, my work is, my life is a draft. I figure we just kind of keep refining it, but I know it's a, it's a, it's a hard question, but I hope that we can discuss and learn from the people's story, the, the stories of the people to focus on that. How, what are the, what are the stories of the people there that we haven't heard? What are they going through? And then a lot of the questions are about um, how would you feel? What would you do? How would you live if you lived in those settings? So I don't know that there's an easy answer to that. I think looking at your book, the the part that I found the most hopeful and helpful um, are in purple and they're um, questions, reflective questions, much like you just said, how, how would it be yeah. for me, right? Um, I'm gonna take a brief pause because it's 829 and then we're gonna have a, a few more minutes of conversation if you're able to be with us, Julie. Can you spare another 10 or 15? Sure. Okay. Um, so for those of you that might need to leave, uh, we've had the, the, the gist of it uh, up till 8.30. Uh, so we appreciate you being here and um, I hope your days are blessed. Next week, we're going to hear from a vice, Chan vice Chancellor at Alamo Colleges, Eric Castillo. He's going to be sharing with us a compassion campaign that's going to be launching across the city in all forms, shapes, and fashion, as well as nationally. Um, so um, we're, we're doing it again in San Antonio, and we're trying to further compassion in a ripple impact um, from San Antonio and forward. So um, see you if you're leaving now, we'll see you next week at the intersection. So now I'm wondering if uh, or anybody who wishes to speak, if you'd raise your hand and your thoughts, your questions, insights, I welcome those. Sharon, I, I see your hand. Um, 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, well, I, um, Julie, thank you very much. Uh, you know, for your long engagement and your heart and your care in bringing all of this. What would I want to say? I feel like I want to say something. Um, and I love your question. How can we bring this book in a beautiful, fruitful way that doesn't end up kind of getting yeah. into the polarization that's so much in the field, right? Yeah. Um, I do not know the answer. I really feel very um, not knowing, but uh, because but maybe, you know, having, if, if it's a discussion group or something like that, then having people with the different sensibilities and sensitivities and um, background present because we don't know yes. what we don't know, right? And, and, and how the other is really taking things. So, but thank you. I mean, really. Sharon, I think you should say a little bit about your work in this area. Because, I mean, well, here you start by thanking Julie for her work. And I'm going to thank you for your work because you have given years to this conversation and to this particular work. Could you say a little bit about that? I'll try to say a little bit. Thank you. Um, well, ever since I... It's hard to say a little bit. Uh, Just say what you need to say. Okay. Um, I have been pursuing the answer to a question, is it possible for people and groups that have been encultured and brought up and imprinted with a certain <laughs> history, a certain point of view, which tells them that the other is not safe both ways. They're going to kill us, they hate us. Is it yeah. possible for people like that to actually come together and stay together? Like you can go to a camp and you realize the other is a human being and you feel all wonderful and you go back yeah. and something happens and it splits. So I have found that what, you know, groups like uh, Roots and the bereaved families form commandments for peace standing together people who have really suffered and been mm -hmm. tempered in the fire and are staying together are are are, are the answer yes it's possible yeah. i've done palestinian canadian life stories project i've done a lot of work but we don't need to go into it um but i'm like i'm happy and i'm heartened to be here and that's all Thank you Thank for that. You, and and I, I haven't talked, I, I tried to put things into also an Israeli perspective. Um however, I, I'm aware that this is um this is controversial. And for me, it's kind of a step. Like I said, it's a draft. I felt like I needed to do this. Now I would like to try it with some interfaith groups and see what happens, see if, see if there can be, and to work with the groups that are already doing work like you, Sharon. And, and okay, I know there's many more, others here. One more thing I would like to say is that um, the, the phrase, the Israeli narrative, which I mean, yeah. everybody uses this, this narrative, it, uh, you know, what you said is people's stories, people's experiences. It's not one narrative set in stone, right? Do you agree? Yes. Oh, I definitely. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the perspective, the Palestinian perspective, for sure. Yeah. For sure. And that's the problem. Yeah. That there there isn't just one. Yes, for sure. Other thoughts and questions. Uh, I I've been reading Julie's uh, book 
for a while. <clears throat> and one of the things that I've learned that I think I'm a pretty well informed person, but I didn't really get the get the fact that um, they're not any really good lines. When we hear on television today and yesterday about two state solutions, which has been bounced around a lot, Julie's got a lot of maps in there. Oh, Julie, if you'd like to say something more about about oh well, she's gone. Um, about how this business of being able to live together is really quite poignant because. There are little pockets of Palestinians all over the place. And I'm really thrown back into despair rather quickly. But Julie, I was asking if you would say something more about how a two-state solution isn't so simple because there aren't any firm lines or they, there are all over the place. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had to take a phone call so I didn't hear that very well um yeah there's lots of data in here or, or lots of information in here but I, as we were talking i i started out wanting stories and when i say the narrative i i don't mean just one i i'm talking about some of the basic history and but but yes uh uh, Sharon, I, I agree with that. And uh, in terms of Nancy, were you talking about the borders? Yeah. Is that and, what you were talking about? And you have many, many maps showing how it's not just the West Bank and Gaza, like it's like Bear County and Comal County or something. It's like yeah. all over the place, there are checkpoints. I mean, like you can't even go five miles without having to go through a checkpoint. This is very much more complicated than I ever imagined. Yeah, and it is complicated, and I know I, I sound simplistic, um, and I didn't talk enough about, I mean, the traumatized children are not just in Palestine and not just in Gaza, for sure, and they all need to have, they all need to have um, care and um, healing. The whole nation needs healing, and that's, that's, what gave me hope and yes um and there were other groups um like that that worked together and the israelis palestinians christian muslim jewish people and our church did a lot of the the dialogue and some of that um but i didn't i didn't have enough room to put more uh things in so i just had to stop it at a point. But as I said, it's a draft and I want to have conversation. I hope it opens conversation in a way that is more focused on story and experience. Uh, Betty, you have your hand up. Um, yes. First, I just want to say thank you. Um, I have not read your book, but I'm in the process of ordering it. And um, it looks really good. And I like what you had to say. Um, I'm curious if you know of anything going on in the San Antonio area, um, bringing folks together specifically to promote peace in the area. Uh, I, I know we've we've uh, started the conversation at my church, but it has been very, um, I don't want to say contentious, but I mean, we're treading carefully because there's, you know, so many different emotions and so many different perspectives. Right. And we really want to be respectful of that. And it's a challenge, but we would like to tap into what's going on in greater San Antonio, if you know of things. Thank you. Um, there are other people much better to speak to that. Um, and I, I see people that are uh, interfaith dialogue and all kinds of work. So Anne, can you address that better than I can? Uh, in one sense, I would ditto what Betty just said about treading carefully in San Antonio. There are others, of course, treading carefully, knowing the importance of the conversation that we're talking about. Um, I know, for example, that the San Antonio Peace Laureates um, have been having a conversation, treading carefully around this, also recognizing the importance to community and what it means um, 
for community conversations to happen about the things that are difficult. Um, and this is one of the most difficult ones. Um, I, I don't know, there are, but I don't know all of them, the different groups. If others know specific groups, the easiest thing might be just to put that in chat of, of local San Antonio efforts in these directions. Um, so I don't know specific ones. I wish I did know more. Um, so I'm going to have to leave it at that. If others have things, please put that into um, chat. Um, I, I will put my email in here. If I don't know if anyone wants to comment or give me feedback or um, in in whatever way, I, I would appreciate that. If uh, but I'm on direct. Uh, One thing that I I want to say um, to Julie, to Sharon in Canada, but to everybody, um, is the recognition of the courage to come this morning. I love the word courage. It's one of my favorites. And it just means to act from the heart. We tend to think or have the perception of courage and, you know, like, I don't know, the soldier was so courageous, you know, to go to war or whatever that is, but it, it really means to act from the heart and not that the soldier might not be that, but to come into the conversation is, is really an act of love, you know, like wanting our world, um, to be people who are working together and wanting to know of the other, the human made just like me, right? Where we have more things in common than we are different. Um, but it, it does take an act, right? To even sign up, open up a Zoom this morning. And so everyone here made that decision, right? knowing uncertainly about what exactly might be said, right? But you decided to. So Peter has his hand up and Martha had her hand up. So Peter, then Martha, Ann. Yes, thank you, Julie, for the, the presentation. And I haven't read the book either, but uh, I've been to Israel over 10 times and have uh, built great relationships there and worked here locally. And uh, the poem was so uh, profound. Uh, when you talk about the Holy Land. And um, and Sharon, thank you for sharing as well in the work uh, that you do. Uh, and I think at the intersection, I think what, uh, Anne, what Anne did uh, when this first came out was she started the series on healing. And I think, Anne, that was very productive in moving us toward the understanding, being able to come to a table with those that we don't agree with. And I think that's what I find most encouraging in San Antonio, is that that's happening at the local level at things that we've talked about that are even external to this specific, but yet we come to that understanding because when you come to a table, you can better relate to the other person's perspective. And that's critical that we're not in our silos. And the thing you said about the Christian church, churches that take that dogma and say, you know, this is what the scripture says. And then you carry that out and you weaponize it. Uh, I think that's something that's, that needs to be said and addressed within each one of our, our uh, doctrines and, and the way that we carry out our faith. So. So thank you, and uh, I'm encouraged. A side book that Peter, and I'll come back to Martha Ann, that Peter made me think of is entitled When Religion Becomes Evil. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it's not a very big book. Um, and right now the author's name escapes me. He's an historical theologian, but his question was, you know, have awful things happened in the name of religion across all the world religions. And his his history research said, yes, indeed, all religions have shed blood in the name of religion. It's And then he, he also has a chapter on hope at the end. I love that you put yours at the beginning, but he was like, 
his equal question was, but could religion all over also be the place of hope that brings us together? So I, I recommend that book, When Religion Becomes Evil. Martha Ann. Be in the chat box, Women Wage Peace. I am so grateful to Sharon that she put me in contact with that group, Women Wage Peace. They are amazing, outstanding. Secondly, I put in chat that our San Antonio Rotary is doing a great job. We will have 16 young people at the Peace Building Academy in Northern Ireland. And then I'm super grateful that um, Dana O'Sally, a Palestinian student, she's north of Jerusalem right now. She sent me a WhatsApp. She's so sorry that she couldn't be here. She will be the UIW representative at the Peace Building Academy in Northern Ireland. So let's give young people a chance to listen to each other's stories. Mm -hmm. It's 847. Uh, we're a little bit old, over. Uh, Julie, do you have time for one more hand? Claudia, look at her. She's like, let me, please. Sure. Me. Claudia. Hi, good morning. It's my first time here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at our organization, we work with poetry for transformation, for conversations, for trauma-related um, uh, healing. And I want to thank you for that last point because uh, it touched my heart and, it, and I can use it to work with the students at UTSA and, and some of the students that come to the organization because I feel that it represents the emotional, spiritual, and physical fatigue that the peacemakers tend to experience when we can see in the front lines of everything. Um, as a veteran, I, I can relate to seeing both sides of the story and actually changing our mind and, and being able to to ex express what is actually the fatigue and the spiritual fatigue that we can experience seeing what you saw. And I can't wait to read your book. Thank you so much for putting poetry in it. We can use it. It can be a tool for us as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Lovely. It gives me a lot of hope to hear that, Claudia. So UTSA. Yes. So thank you all for being here this week. Um, thank you for your courage of walking into what you knew would might and probably was difficult, uncertain, but you did it. So thank you for that. Gives me hope for our city and for our world. Uh, I hope to see you next week when we're trying to spread compassion as far as wide we can from San Antonio. And I uh, can't wait for you to hear how exciting this uh, campaign is going to be. Thank you all. Have great weekends. It's supposed to be pretty hot here, so do those things you know you need to do. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye.